Okay, so um, there's no big distinction, no kind of sea change that we're going to uh, go here um, in terms of um, what we're up to. We're going to continue to learn about circuits and how to analyze them. And um, one of the things we're going to do is take a very similar types of circuits we've already been looking at, but look at a different way of, of solving them. Um, that's what's something called Kirchhoff's rules. That's contrasting versus the method of equivalent resistance, which is on your homework number three, which we just uh, talked about. And I purposely kept it like this because I didn't want you on homework number three, and therefore exam number one, to have to struggle with which method do you use to attack a circuit. So Kirchhoff's rules is on homework four. It's not on exam one. You don't have to speculate if that you need to use it. You just are going to use the method of equivalent resistance. Okay. That's what you're going to use on your, your first exam. So um, let me remind you what is the method of equivalent resistance. We just finished it last lecture, but basically it's this. You get your circuit, you condense all of your resistors down into one equivalent resistance. That equivalent resistance of your entire circuit and then uh, the battery voltage that you connect it to is going to determine the total current. So once you have the total current, you start breaking back apart, figuring out all the different uh, voltage drops and current flows for your individual elements. Um, so Kirchhoff's so rules just take a different approach. So I'm going to compare and contrast them. So the method of equivalent resistance is intuitive, where Kirchhoff's rule is mathematical. So, um, you may not think at this point it's intuitive, uh, the, the method we just talked about, but I think you'll find it is more intuitive. A Kirchhoff's rule is you just kind of feel like you're wading through some math, okay? Um, so there's a, certainly an argument for a method of equivalent resistance, um, but obviously there are pros and cons to each. The method of equivalent resistance is usually easier if you're given the resistances and you're asked for the currents. Okay. So it's not totally symmetric in terms of knowns and unknowns. Um, it's usually easier if you're, all the resistances are known because then of course you can combine them without too much trouble hopefully into REQ which is a very important thing to know. And if one of the resistances isn't known then you might uh, it's not as straightforward. It's not that you can't work around it, and there's, I know there's at least one simple homework problem where you work around not knowing uh, what one of the resistors is, but I'm just saying in general the flow is more towards knowing resistors and trying to find the currents. An advantage of Kirchhoff's rules, like the fact that it's mathematical kind of makes it annoying in one sense, but it also means that all the unknowns are essentially equivalent. So really, it doesn't care at all, okay? So uh, it has no preference between the knowns and unknowns. They're all just variables. So we're going to have to give it here to uh, Kirchhoff's rules as being an advantage, okay? So it, yes, it, it can give you the resistances and ask for the currents, but it could also give you the currents and ask for the resistances. It doesn't matter. And then the big tiebreaker is this. The method of equivalent resistance generally requires that there be only one battery. So there's a very well-known source of voltage you know what's the higher voltage, you know what's the lower voltage, and you can unequivocally determine the current directions that will flow as a result. So, unambiguous current directions. Let's see if I can spell this. Unambiguous. Big, no. Big, you, us, current directions that result. Okay, because, of course, the battery, that determines what's the top of the line, the highest voltage equipotential, what's the bottom of the line, the lowest voltage equipotential, and the cascade or waterfall from one to the other is well established. Okay? 
Kirchhoff's rules can actually do, um, um, it's not that it, it can do one, but it can do more than one battery. That's more, not move. So what it can do is have basically um, more than one voltage source in a problem. You can basically have batteries that are either reinforcing each other or competing against each other. And then sometimes you don't know who wins. So here, it can deal with ambiguous current directions. It's not always clear which way the current will really flow if you have multiple potentially conflicting uh, batteries acting in the circuit. So that's probably the bigger, big dead giveaway. Um, if you see more than one battery in a circuit, you should immediately think use Kirchhoff rules. Okay. Um, okay. So let me tell you what Kirchhoff's rules are, and then we'll apply them to a problem, and you can see how it works. Um, I should, guess I should say here, ambiguous current directions are okay. You can deal with that. All right. Um, okay, so Kirchhoff's rules number one. They are both rules that we kind of already know. They kind of, we're just really almost naming them or repackaging things we already know. Uh, the first of the two rules is the junction rule. Um, a junction is basically a fork in the circuit. It's a fork in the road where charge will come in, it'll flow in, and some of it will go one direction, some of it will go another. So, for instance, here's a fork in the circuit. That's a wire meant by two other wires, like that. And the junction rule simply says, what goes in must come out. We've already been using this. You'll find good use for it in homework number three. So in homework number three, if you have one current going into a junction and a lesser current uh, coming out of one fork, then of course the rest of it is in the other fork. So an example of a junction rule, let's say I've labeled the current coming into this junction as I1, and I've labeled, labeled the two currents coming out of that junction, I2 and I3, an example of the junction rule in this particular case is I1 equals I2 plus I3, right? What goes in must come out. Now, you don't always have to label the current coming in I1. It's however it's labeled. It's just what goes in must come out. It's really just a charge conservation, okay? It's a making, way of making sure that electrical charge doesn't appear or disappear. It's all accounted for somewhere. So what goes in must come out. Okay. So that's the junction rule, really kind of old news. For instance, I know in several homework problems, you might have one of the currents going into a junction, you know one of them going out, and you, of course, use that to figure out what's the current in the other branch, right? So to make it all balance out. So we're really just giving it a name. We're calling it the junction rule. Second rule is called loop rule. I guess before I get to the loop rule, are there any questions on the junction rule? Okay. So um, let me talk about the, uh, the loop rule. Again, something that we already know, um, but repackaged slightly differently. Um, here's how I want to uh, talk about it. So let's say um, I'm in this room and I have a, uh, a fancy watch, one of those watches that has, a, uh, it can read my altitude above sea level. So what's our altitude above sea level here? I would guess maybe, I don't know, 500 feet, something like that. So I'll write that down on a piece of paper. And then, I'm going to go for a hike. I'm going to go hike up. If you notice, there's a very large ridge line right here, Sweeney Ridge. You can go up. It's substantially higher than where we are now. And of course, 
hydrogen like up there. You are going to go to a larger altitude, right? And then maybe you can, uh, once you're up there, you decide you're going to go down to the beach. Okay, so you're going to go all the way down to the ocean level. And of course, you're going to get a lower elevation. And then, when you hike back here, your watch will report that you are back at 500 feet, unless there's been some kind of seismic event, some major seismic event. When you come back into this room, it will read the same thing as before. And of course, the difference is zero. So anytime that you walk in a closed loop, despite any height gains, this will be a height gain, delta H will be positive when you go to a larger height. When you go to a, a lower height, delta H will be negative. But if you do it in a closed loop, of course, you're going to end up with the sum of your gains and your drops being zero, because you've ended where you started. That is the essence of a loop rule. So of course, instead of going and hiking around, we're going and taking a hypothetical hike around the circuit. Okay? And the things that you're going to encounter aren't height changes, they're voltage changes. But, if you walk in a closed loop, the sum of all your gains and drops will be zero. Okay? Which is just to acknowledge the fact that a given place in the circuit, wherever it is that you started your hike, when you finish your hike, I'm not saying that that's zero voltage, I'm saying is that that point in the circuit is the whatever voltage that is, is, is consistent, right? The, a given point in the circuit can't have two different voltages. Which means that if you start there and you end there, the sum of all your differences that you experience will all cancel out and you will end up with zero, okay? And in circuits, of course, the one thing that we've already uh, kind of talked about quite a bit, there's no use really even in assigning particular voltage values to locations anymore. We only talk about differences, right? So what we're saying, we go in a closed loop around a circuit with the sum of the voltage gains and drops being zero, that means that there's no change. That spot is the same voltage uh, as when you left, okay? And of course, in this case, the, the hikes are hypothetical. They don't take any time. So it's really just saying is that any given part of the circuit has to have a mutually consistent voltage. You can't have two different voltages. Okay? So that's the loop rule. And again, it's not something that we, uh, we kind of already know. Um, we've, we've basically had it in not so many words before. For instance, we draw circuits like this. This would be our classic uh, series circuit, right? And we've drawn the voltage waterfalls, right, that look like this. So basically you have there that you can drop from the highest voltage of the battery to the lower voltage of the battery in a two-step process, right? And we've said that the entire drop can be had across the two resistors. Well, another way to put that would simply be if we took a walk around the circuit and we started here, then as we went, we'd experience gains and drops. But when we got back there, the gains and drops should be equal to zero. So let's take a look at the particular things that we have seen in the circuit. Um, let me go over here. Right now we only have two different circuit elements. We have a battery, and we have a resistor. So here are the things you can encounter on your hike. You could encounter a battery where you happen to be able to go from the lower voltage to the higher voltage terminal, right? Now remember this is a hike, so this is a hypothetical just looking at what you could do, and that'll be a voltage gain, right? But if you happen to be walking this way, 
you would experience a voltage drop, of course, because you're going from the higher voltage to the lower voltage terminal now, right? So if, uh, and then I guess let me do the resistor. Well, resistor is, of course, an inert quantity. Current can flow either way, so we should probably say which way does the current flow. Well, let's say the current's flowing this way. So along your hikes, you can encounter a resistor. You could walk upstream to the current, in which case you'll experience uh, a voltage gain, right? We know that current flows to lower voltage, and if you're going the other way, you're going to higher voltage. So this would be a voltage gain of I times R by Ohm's law, or you could be walking with the current, and of course, then you'll experience a voltage drop. The analogy I can mention here is if you had a river, right? A river always flows to lower height, right? There's no rivers that flow uphill, okay? So, you can either choose to walk with the river, and you're going to go be going downhill, of course, or, you know, you can, or he, as a human being, can choose to walk uphill. But if you're going to walk uphill, and you're going to go to larger height, you're, of course, going to be walking against the river flow. That's what we have here. The current is bound to flow to lower voltage, if you happen to be walking with it, you'll be going to lower voltage as well and experience a drop, but you are able to also choose to wade against the current and go to higher voltage, okay? So let's go over here and, and do a hypothetical loop here. I'm going to start my hike here, and the very first thing I encounter is a battery, and I'm going from the lower voltage to the higher voltage terminal. So is that going to be a gain or drop? That's going to be a gain. And then, um, I'm going to encounter two resistors where I happen to be going with the current. My current is going to be sent this way, right? So if I walk through a resistor um, going with the current, is that a gain or a drop? Drop. So it will be minus V1, minus V2, and then I arrive back at my destination, so the sum of those gains and drops should be zero, and hopefully you can see that this is completely mathematical equivalent to what we would have already said. So it's kind of old news. The only difference really is that we put all the voltages on one side, so the other one it's, is zero, okay? Okay, are there any questions on that? Okay, so with that in mind, let's just go ahead and start with an example. And the thing is, oh, and I guess uh, I should mention, just like this is sometimes called the charge conservation, this is kind of sometimes called the energy conservation. Because if the sum of the voltage drops and gains uh, in a closed loop has to be zero because uh, a given part of the circuit cannot have two voltages simultaneously. Well, remember, a voltage is, of course, energy per charge. So it's like saying it can have two different energies per charge simultaneously, which doesn't, again, it doesn't make sense. Um, so the amazing thing is that asking the circuit to obey these very, very fundamental, almost trivially obvious things, we're asking that all the charge should be there, it shouldn't go missing, and that a, any given part of the circuit has to maintain a mutually consistent voltage. And just with those two seemingly trivial statements, you can take a very complicated circuit and figure out exactly what must be happening. And that's what I'm about to show you. Okay? So it's kind of a, ends up being a lot of math to solve, but I do want to point out that the fundamental cool part of Kirchhoff's is you're writing down a bunch of very trivial, fundamental statements about what the circuit has to do, and then you will get the answers to a bunch of things. So here's my example. And by the way, I should mention you guys will have a lab on this as well. So you guys will get a chance to hook up one of these and get to see it. So here's my circuit. Make sure to get the details right. I have one battery over here. I have another battery over here, and I have some resistors. If 
fact that it has two batteries, dead giveaway that Kirchhoff's is where, how you are going to want to go on this. The method of equivalent resistance is not your friend here. It's not that you can't shoehorn it to work, but um, I'm not going to get into how to do that. Kirchhoff's is the easiest way. Let me enable my batteries. They're going to have different EMFs. It's going to be 20 volts and 5 volts. So I have two different um, uh, batteries that are both going to inform what's happening. And then let me label my resistances R1, R2, and R3. And those resistances are labeled for uh, just for labeling purposes only because all three of these resistors are actually going to be 10 ohms. That just means that um, I don't want to be doing math with you all day, so I'm trying to make it so that this is, I can show you all the interesting features of this without necessarily doing boring algebra too much. So let me start by showing you why Kirchhoff's is necessary. If we were to go through here, we would find that the direction of the currents in each resistor is not at all clear. What we actually have are competing influences. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take a look at what each battery would want alone, and we'll see that they don't always agree. This one, this battery I'll label in red. And uh, let me see what that would, um, that, that would do. Well, current, of course, flows off the high voltage terminal. It would come over here, it would split, right, it would fork off. Some of it would go this way. And if I were pretending the other battery weren't here, I just replaced it with like a straight wire or something like that, then of course current would proceed through R3 like this. And then these two currents would combine. I total would flow through R1 again before uh, going into the negative terminal. So that's what, if battery one had its way, that's what would happen. So let's take a look at um, battery two. So if that were the only battery, so I replaced the other one with just a piece of straight wire, um, short circuit, what would happen then? Well, the total current would flow off of the high voltage terminal. It would split at this junction. Some of it would go down through R2, and some of it would continue on over here, going through R1. Then they would merge before going through R3 and entering the negative or lower voltage terminal, the better. So what you see here is that while the two uh, batteries both agree on which way current should flow through the middle resistor there, R2, they are in disagreement about what happens through R1 and R3. So which one wins, if either? It's possible even for there to be no current at all. So this is the beauty of Kirchhoff's rules method, is that it is OK with this ambiguity. Okay? You can actually not even worry about figuring out this. Okay? I just wanted to motivate why the, the, it might be ambiguous. But all you do is you take a guess, okay? So it turns out that you can guess on the currents, and there's no major penalty for guessing wrong. It's a simple little thing at the end that tells you, the calculation tells you you guessed wrong, and it's an easy fix. So here what you can do is just guess the current directions. Um, so here's what I'm going to guess. Uh, I'm going to, well, first of all, this one, I might as well grab the benefit of the fact that I know that one's right. Okay, so I, won't, I don't want to pick that one wrong on purpose because you, you know you know that I'm picking that wrong and it's kind of not as exciting. I'm going to pick one of the other ones wrong, but you're not going to know which one. Okay, so this one's going to be I two. I'm going to guess that, and then I'm going to guess. Uh, what did I guess? I have, let me make sure to. It's consistent with what I have here. I guess I1 goes like this. And uh, I2 goes like, uh, I3 goes like this. Oops, yeah, that's right. 
Is that what I want? Yeah. Okay. So those are just guesses. Okay. I purposely picked one of those wrong so that we can see it's no big tragedy. We'll find out at the end and just fix it. Okay. Now, when you're guessing current directions, you can guess anything you want, but there's one caveat to this. You can guess your current directions. Make sure that these are independent guesses. So there's, here's a common mistake that students make. Let's say, and again, this is not the case here because I wanted to keep it simple, um, but let's say that there's a uh, resistor over here. So let me just throw one in for a second. Let's suppose there's a resistor right here on this branch. You, that is not an independent guess from one of the other currents. This right here, uh, if I guess the current one to go this way, then that's in series with this one. So you have to guess something that is not self-contradictory, right? If you pick I1 to be here, then you have to pick I1 to be here. Okay? You can't guess something that is already conflicting with itself, okay? So they might both be wrong at this point. Maybe instead of going left and then up like this, maybe they both are wrong and it's actually going like this, but you can't guess that they're going at each other. That doesn't make any sense, okay? Now the thing that complicates it is that fact that there's a battery in between, right? So you might think, does current have to be the same in series even if there's a battery in between? Yes, okay? Now I know that the inner workings of a battery have remained somewhat mysterious to us, but the best way to think of a battery is, is like a pump, okay? Charge goes in one end and it gets pumped up to a higher voltage and pulls out the other end. So the current flow has to be the same in series. That's not only for resistors, but also for batteries as well, okay? So, so you can guess your current directions as long as they're independent guesses, but make sure that they are mutually consistent, okay? meaning you're not already guessing something that can be completely contradicting itself. Okay. So now let me pull this extra resistor that we don't have out of there and proceed to the problem. Um, okay, so now that I have my current directions guessed, they may not all be correct, but that doesn't matter. We're just going to start writing down our rules. So let's start with the junction rule. So, not every circuit has a junction. Some of them are so simple that they don't have one, but this circuit has two junctions. It has a junction right here, where there's a connection of one or more wires, and there's another one right here. Okay. So, let's go ahead, I guess, and start in on the bottom junction. What current or currents go into it? I2 goes in, and what current or currents uh, come out of it? I1 and I3 as well, right? I3, if you want to draw it, looks like this, right? So if you want to draw them like, a little bit like that, you can. You can show what goes in, what comes out. Okay, so that's the junction rule. Let's, let's do the other junction. Let's do what comes out of it first. Um, definitely what comes out is I2. Now here's where we have to remember that current is the same in series, even across the battery. So uh, I1 will be coming into it, right? And I3 will also be coming into it. So I1 and I3 flow in. Now, what do you notice about these two equations so far? They're the same. Basically, what you have is that even though you have two junctions, you've only gotten one independent mathematical statement. Because what happens is in the top junction, two currents merge into uh, the middle current, and then they just split apart again at the bottom junction. They just kind of loop around like this. Right? So we only have one independent mathematical equation thus far. In fact, we're going to omit the other one like this. And obviously, that alone is not going to help me because I have 
three unknowns in one equation, there's no way that that's doable, right? But I haven't, of course, used my loop rules, so let's do my loop rules, okay? So, um, let's go ahead and um, pick a closed loop and just take a hike around it and do the sum of the gains and drops of voltage and we should have it to zero. Um, and let me do the left loop first. Go around like that. So I'll hike around the left uh, side of the circuit. So let me label these. Uh, this will be the left loop. This is the junction rule, of course. So let's write down the left loop. So where do you start? Doesn't matter. Okay, so let me start with the, uh, I don't know, I don't know why I like it, but I like to start here by the, um, the lower voltage terminal. The very first thing I encounter is the battery, and do I go to higher voltage or lower voltage going around this way? Higher. Okay. The very next thing I encounter, well, first of all, there's a wire that's an empty potential plateau, so no voltage change. Then I go through resistor 2 with the current. So if I go with the current, do I go to higher or lower voltage? Lower. So I2, R2, Ohm's law. And then finally, I go through resistor 1 going with the current. So is that a gain or drop? Drop again. So I have gain, drop, drop, equals sum of all which is zero. So if I went in that loop, and I started and ended at a different place, as long as I closed the loop, I would get, just get these terms in a different order, right? You just hit the things in a different order. What if you went the other way? Well, if you went counterclockwise, you'd get a drop across the battery, but then a gain and a gain across the two resistors, because now you're going with the, uh, against the current, right? So is that a different mathematical statement if you had the signs on this side reversed? No, because it's still zero, right, on the other side, which means you can multiply through by negative one and you have the same thing. So again, as long as you go in a closed loop, it doesn't matter where you start, it doesn't matter which way you go around, you'll get the same exact thing. Okay, so that's the, the left side of the circuit, that is what you'll effectively get mathematically in terms of the loop. Let's do the, uh, the right side. So I'll go around this way. Okay, so where do I start? I guess, pick any point, I'll start the lower voltage term of the battery. The very first thing I, I do is I go across resistor 3. Now, am I going with or against the current? against the current. So is that a voltage gain or drop? It's a gain. So very first thing I get is, um, and let me not list them in this order. I want to make a point a little bit later. So hopefully it doesn't bother you. I can list them in any order. Um, the next thing I do, oh wait, I didn't want to list it in order. I'm sorry. I'll put it over here. Um, the next thing I do is I'm going to go across resistor 2, right? So am I going with or against the current? Again, so is that a gain or drop? It's a gain, so I'll put that right here. And then finally, I go across the battery, going from the higher voltage to the lower voltage terminal. So is that a gain or drop? That's a drop. And the sum of those equals zero. All right, let's do some more practice. There's one more hike I can take here. I could do the big loop. I can go all the way around the outside. That's another closed loop. I'm going to do a bigger hike. So the big loop. More practice is good. I'm going to start on the outside, go in here, and then I'll go all the way around like this. So very first thing I encounter battery one, is that a gain or drop? 
gain. Okay, the very next thing I encounter after that is the second battery. Is that a gain or a drop? Drop. And then I encounter uh, resistor three. Is that a gain or a drop? It's a gain, I'm going against the current. And then I encounter uh, resistor one going with the current. So is that a gain or a drop? Drop. drop. And the sum of those should add to zero. Of course, resistor 2 does not appear because my big hike was on the outside, and so resistor 2 was not in my path, right? So I want to point out something. Um, do you notice anything about the big equation and how it relates to these two? I heard it over there. It's a sum, yeah, look at this. So you have E1 minus E2, that's here. You have uh, I3, R3, it's here. I1, R1 with a negative, that's here. And then, of course, this adds to zero, so it doesn't appear. So the, the big equation is really not, the big loop equation is not its own independent equation. It's the sum of the previous two. If you want to see a nice uh, visualization of that, the left loop looked like this. The uh, right loop looked like this. And if you kind of think of what happens when you combine those two, right? Well, the gain and the drop here are going to cancel, right? These two right here. And what do you get as a result? You get this. That's kind of a nice visualization of it. Okay. Now, the big loop is good for a couple of reasons. First of all, pr more practice with gains and drops is always good. And it's nice to have the extra option around for algebra. Because the big loop does not have I2 in it. And if we want an equation that doesn't have I2 in it, then we have one. Okay. Because at this point, the physics is done. We've write, written down a series of trivial statements of charge conservation and energy conservation, which is your junction rules and your loop rules, and then we just solve. Now we have a big pile of equations that we need to solve for the variables. So this is where the physics ends and the math begins. Simultaneous equations, right? And you remember, you can solve two equations, two unknowns, three equations, three unknowns, four equations, four unknowns, right? As you can solve for as many variables as you have uh, independent equations. In my case, oh, I never told you what I was looking for. <laughs> I should probably, if it wasn't already obvious, uh, the only things left here, of course, I'm going to solve for the three currents. So if I have only three unknowns, I only need three of these equations. I have one extra. But uh, as you're going to see, um, it's nice to have some options around. Okay. So it's better to have more equations than you need than less, for sure. Okay. Um, so uh, let me go ahead first and simplify these equations. The first one doesn't actually simplify at all because all it has is the unknowns. But these three loop equations are going to simplify by the fact that I'm going to plug in the battery voltages and the resistances. Now, of course, I would normally encourage you to solve symbolically, but this is definitely a big exception. It's going to get way, way, way too complicated if you try to do that. So I'm going to put in my battery voltages and resistances. And of course, since I'm plugging in the numbers very early, you have to be very careful of round off error. So, Remember to keep at least three significant figures on every uh, intermediate calculation in your answers. So here's what you get. Uh, the, the left loop equation, um, the only things that are actually unknown in there are I1 and I2. And so everything else is going to be a number. 
and I'll, let me just tell you what you get. If you plug in everything, you should be able to show this is what you get. Uh, the next one, I2 and I3 are the only unknowns. And if you plug in everything else, and again, I don't want to bore you with showing you this, so work it out at home. I2 plus I3 is 0.5. And the last one has two unknowns, I1 and I3. And you will get, if you plug in everything else, I1 minus I3 is 1.5. So, that, those equations look a lot more palatable for solving for the unknowns, they may not always look that nice. One of the reasons they look that nice is because all of my resistance values are equal. But nonetheless, you probably have not, I'm getting a guess from your math classes, you should have spent some considerable amount of time solving two equations, two unknowns, yes. But probably have not spent as much time solving three equations, three unknowns, right? My guess. Has anyone ever solved the three equations three unknown system? Okay, nobody. Okay, so here's what happens with three equations three unknowns. In two equations and two unknowns, it's really easy. You solve one of the equations for one variable, put it in the other, you're good to go. When you start to have three or more unknowns, it becomes like whack-a-mole. You guys know whack-a-mole, the game? Okay, you have a little felt hammer, right? And every time you hit one mole, another one pops up. That's what happens with three variables and three unknowns. You're trying to get condensed down to one variable and suddenly one pops up that you don't want, okay? So if you are stumbling around in the forest or whatever, okay, you're going to be in a whack-a-mole situation. I'm going to suggest to you a recipe for solving three equations to unknowns that will get you straight there, okay? So here's what I recommend. I recommend that you pick the equation that has all your unknowns, which is in this case the junction rule, and you use it as your anchor, okay? Which is to say that that's the thing that everything else is going to get plugged into, all right? So let me recopy it down here. I2 equals I1 plus I3. And then you can pick at random which one of the three you're going to solve for first. So in my case, let me pick um, I2. Okay, so I'm just going to keep this one. It's my keeper. That's the one I'm going to gun for first. Which means that I need to get rid of the other ones in place of that one. So instead of I1, I want I1 is going to be blah, 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 I2. And I3 is going to be blah, 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 I2. Okay. Then I get one master equation which has three different mentions of I2, but hey, if it's all I2, now you can group and solve, right? So this is where I go to my other equations, and I take a look. Which equation is going to let me get I1 and I2, uh, I1 in terms of I2? The second one, the, the left one, right? And which equation is going to let me get I3 in terms of I2? right one, because it's the only two variables in it, right? So I won't need the big equation, the big loop equation. In fact, I can toss it. I don't need it in my particular case. Of course, I had more equations than I really needed, right? I really only need three of these. Three equations are all needed for three unknowns. But notice that me happening to use the first three of the four is symptomatic of the, which keeper I chose at random. Like, let's say I picked, uh, uh, instead of doing that, let's say I pick I3 as my keeper current. So then I want to get I1 is blah, 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 I3, and I2 is blah, 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 I3, right? Then I have a big monster equation for I3. So which equation would I use? If I wanted to get uh, relate I two and I three together, 
right, use the right equation. And which equation is going to let me relate I1 and I3 together? That's the big one. So if you had chosen at random another keeper current, you would have found yourself using the right equation and the big equation and tossing the left. You're not really tossing it, by the way. Remember that it's in the big equation, right? The big equation actually is the sum of the left and right. So you are using that information. But the big is just nice to have around so that you don't have to do any particular prep work in advance. You have it already, a relationship between I1 and I3. So that's why the big one is nice to write down. It's not just extra practice, but it lets you pick a keeper current at random knowing that you're going to have exactly what you need to grab from. Okay. So let's stay with the original plan. Um, let's go ahead and um, plug in to this. So I have I2 equals, and I'm going to plug in for both I1 and I3. So this is going to be I1. This is going to be I3. And I go to my left equation, and my left equation tells me I1 equals 2 minus I2. And I go to my left right equation, and it tells me I3 is going to be 0.5 minus I2. The first current's the hardest, and the rest will fall like dominoes. I have no doubt that you guys can group like terms here. Notice, by the way, that this is I2 over here, and then you have a minus I2 and a minus I2, so if you bring them all over here, you're going to get what? 3I2, right? And then you have some numbers over there, and then you divide by 3. So I2 comes out to be 0.833 amps. The first one's the hardest, but you've also prepped yourself for success because look at this. 2 minus I2 is I1, and 0.5 minus I2 is I3, so the other ones fall like dominoes. So I can just quickly go put that back in here and get I1 I and I3. And let me tell you what results. Uh, I1 is 1.167 amps. And uh, I3 is minus 0 0.333 amps. Now, one of them came out minus. That tells you that that was an incorrect guess. The number is right. The sign being negative tells you you guessed the direction wrong. That's the only penalty for guessing incorrectly. Okay? So if the sign is minus, so if you get a negative current, the amount is right, the uh, direction guess was wrong. So you guessed a direction from the beginning, you apparently guessed wrong, you stuck to your guns to the end of the problem until that negative sign came out, then you realized the error of your ways, no big deal, you switched the sign, okay? So if we went back over, it's usually good form to redraw the circuit diagram with all the currents flowing in the right direction. Let's look at that and make sure that it makes sense, okay? Um, actually, before I do that, are there any questions on the math part of what I just did? Okay, so let's go ahead and redraw what it looks like correctly. So here is what was really happening. We had our two batteries, our resistors, And I'm going to draw in the currents again. I2 was correct. Oh, let me get a better uh, marker here. 
I2 is correct, and we solve for the amount of which it was 0 0.833 amps. Our guess for I1 was correct because it came out positive. I1 was 1.167 amps. And then the one that we correct is uh, I3, which we had guessed is flowing up, but apparently it's down. So this is the corrected version. Well, it's like this, I3, and the amount is correct, 0.333 amps. So that's what's really happening. Let's double check that this makes sense. We have that in this junction right here, we have 833 milliamps flowing into it from over here, 333 milliamps flowing in here, and combining to 1,167. You can double check. Does that add up? Uh, not quite. There's a last decimal place is a little off. That's, of course, just in, as you can probably guess, these are repeating decimals, right? So this is really 0.833333, and this is really 0.333333, and that adds up to 1.166666. So we have a little tiny bit of round out there, right? Because 3 plus 3 does not add up to 7. Don't worry about it, okay? Just keep your results to at least three significant figures, and you should land within web assigned tolerance. You should, of course, make sure that your answers seem to make sense, right? If this plus this does not come anywhere remotely equal to this, then you obviously did something wrong. As much as solving three equations and three unknowns is really annoying, you don't really need to use all five attempts on WebAssign. All you have to do is, once you get your answers, put them back in the equations. And if they don't work, then it's wrong, right? The whole point is you're trying to solve for variables to satisfy the equations. When you get your results at the end, make sure that they do what they're supposed to do, right? So. Let's take a look at what ha what's happening here. What's happening here, apparently, is that this battery is getting its way completely. Okay? All of the current flows are consistent with that battery getting its way. Right? Current wants to flow here. It flows across here. It just forces its way through the other battery. And then they merge again and go like this. So if we look at these results, it's a bit strange, but we realize it's no surprise that this battery kind of won because this is a 20 volt battery, and that 20 volt battery is fighting a much smaller battery. So it's no wonder, in this case, it's a simple enough circuit that we can intuitively reason that if you have a 20 volt and a 5 volt acting against each other, the 20 volt's going to win. And we have a somewhat unusual circumstance here. We have that. We've never seen this before, where current is supposed to flow off a high voltage terminal, and yet it's being forced onto it. Okay? So this is a time where one battery is not doing its thing at all, because it's being forced to do exactly the opposite by a bigger battery. Okay? This kind of thing uh, happens all the time. If you, for instance, recharge your car battery, if your battery went dead, or you have rechargeable batteries, that's exactly what you're doing. In fact, that's worth uh, addressing how to jumpstart a car, okay? So let's say you have your car battery. Let's say your car battery, you left your lights on or something, right? It's dead. You know, what do you do? Maybe it's gone down to like one volt. Maybe not all the way down to zero, probably not. Just not enough to start your car, right? So normally, current is supposed to be coming off of this, but it can't have enough, it can't generate enough current. So what do you do? Well, you hook it up, you get your friend, get the jumper cables going, right? And your car, uh, your friend's car, properly charged, let's say it's 9 volts. I can't remember, but I think that's what car batteries are. 12 volts? All right, 12 volts. Okay, so what you do? 
How do you connect it? Connect it like this. So you connect your positive terminal to their positive terminal. Okay? Red to red and black to black. Okay? So remember, light colors. That's important. So the 12 volts is going to provide current that flows off of this and onto yours. Exactly the opposite of what it normally does, right? Normally current flows off of that positive terminal, but it's putting positive charges on here so that they can flow off later, right? So that's how you jump a car, is by basically making current flow onto a battery versus off a battery, right? So then, later on, they can, of course, have this go back up to 9 volts, and then the current can flow off again, right? That's the idea. Now, as a public service here, I should mention, one of the worst ways you can do a charge a car is by connecting unlike colors. So here's what you're doing when you do that. So imagine you have a one volt battery and you, your friend tries to jump you, but it's like this. So you connect red to black and black to red. Well, now these batteries are actually reinforcing. They both want the current to flow the same way. This one wants it to flow this way, and so does this one. That can actually create a dangerously large amount of current because your quote unquote dead battery is not really dead. And so now it'll be a lot more current circulating because both batteries agree. You're not forcing charge onto one, you're letting them both circulate current, and that can be very dangerous. You have a large current, and that's not what you want to have. Okay? So remember when you're jumping someone, never connect red to black and black to red. Okay? Don't mix your colors. It's light colors. Red to red, black to black. Okay? There are more advanced things like grounding one of the things, but I'm not going to get into that. But don't ever cross colors. Okay? Um, so, uh, I could even draw for you um, one of my voltage waterfalls, okay? So maybe this will be helpful to so visualize this. This is like a system where there's more than one pump in it. So what you have is your main pump, your 20 volt pump, and you have the option to get from one uh, all the way down to resistors two and then one. So resistor two and then resistor one. That's one option. Okay? But you have another option, okay? To get to this point right here, you don't have to go through resistor two. What you basically have is a 5 volt defective pump that you're forcing water down through, okay? And then you continue on flowing through resistor uh, 3. And that gets you to the same place. So think of it like this, even though that second battery, there's nothing wrong with it, it loses out to the second battery. Think of it like this, right? If you put a perfectly functioning water pump up and you put it under Niagara Falls, guess what? Water's going to go down through it, okay? The pump will slow down the water slightly, but trust me, if you put a water pump under Niagara Falls, Niagara Falls wins, okay? So what this battery does is they put is a fixed voltage drop of 5 volts into the path. Okay? Question? So it's kind of exactly like a resistor? Yes. With the only difference that it always provides a 5 volt drop, it's not dependent on the current. Right? So the, the battery's internal workings make sure that its voltage drop is maintained at 5 volts or whatever, uh, regardless of the current. Um, Okay, are there any questions on that? Okay. I presume that V3 then goes down and connects, or is it going over 
Uh, well, I mean, it's remember that if you go this way or this way, you end up at the same point. Everybody okay. has to channel through resistor one at the end. So okay. if this bothers you, I mean, this doesn't really matter where this is located. If you want, you can you can draw it like this. It doesn't really matter. Okay. You have to draw. It through, everybody has to channel through resistor one at the end. Right. There's no uh, options there. Um, in these diagrams, there's nothing significant about the left-right axis. I just don't want to draw everything on top of until, right? So kind of fan out our waterfall so we can see all the different uh, possibilities. Um, any other questions? Okay, so you guys will have a lab on that, and you have some homework questions on that. Um, and we will uh, occasionally need to throw down a, lump, a junction or a loop on you know, other circuits as we progress through. Um, okay. Next order of business, fill on circuits. We are going to introduce a new circuit element. So right now we only have batteries and resistors. Now we're going to introduce what's called a capacitor. And uh, let me give you a little bit of a preview of all the things we need to talk about. Um, and let me compare it against the resistor, because that's our other major circuit element, right? So what do we know about resistors? Well, we know what is their function. Resistors take electric potential energy and send it to heat, right? That's what they do. Use them in space heaters and stuff. Something light bulb is just an old incandescent light bulb just generates enough heat to glow and partly invisible. What does a capacitor do? Well, it stores that potential energy. It stores it for later. So if a resistor is something that dissipates energy to the environment, a capacitor is some place, a reservoir where you can store that energy for later use. Okay? So over here, of course, we talked about the power dissipation formula, of which we have three forms to choose from. Over here, we're going to develop a potential energy formula. So you can see the parallels there. Um, what else? Well, I guess before, I, this is, I should have maybe written this down first. What's the fundamental definition of resistance? Right? Resistance is uh, what relates how much current flow you get for how much voltage drop is available, right, across the resistor. So the voltage drop is the motivation. And then the current flow that actually occurs will be also dependent on the resistance you put in the way. So this is Ohm's law kind of de defines what resistance really means. Okay? So we're also going to have to define, just like resistance, we're going to have to define something called capacitance. We also talked about the fact that you can actually calculate the resistance from the physical properties of the thing itself. Okay? So there's physical properties of the thing determine how much or how little resistance something has. Well, the same thing is going to be true of capacitance. We need to find what is the capacitance of something based on its physical properties. We talked about resistors in series and parallel. And there were, of course, uh, some addition rules for how to do that. And we're also going to find that these circuit elements can be placed in series and parallel. So you see there's a lot of similarities. 
And then I'm going to add two more topics on the capacitor side. It turns out if you want to store energy, it takes time to store energy. So we're going to take a look at the timing of the what we call charging and discharging. So this is going to be a situation where we're, are, we're going to have some functions of time. Okay? So this is not relevant to resistors because basically once you connect the resistor, it just does this thing over time uh, constantly, right? It's just going to draw a certain amount of current. But it's going to turn out that it's going to we're going to be interested in storing energy, and you can't store energy indefinitely. You can dissipate energy indefinitely, but you can't store energy indefinitely. So we're going to look at the timing of how long it takes to store X amount of energy. Okay? So these are going to involve something called exponential functions. So exponential functions, hopefully you're familiar with that from math class. We're going to find very good use for them uh, here. And then the other thing we have to discuss, uh, one of the things that uh, we can do is we can soup up the performance of a capacitor. We can make it perform better. And that is done with something called dielectrics. So this helps to improve the capacitance. Okay. Makes it a better storage device. And there, just to give you a little bit of a preview, is where we find use for partial shielding, which you may remember from homework number two. We didn't really have a very good use for it at the time. We talked about perfect shielding in conductors being very important, right? What protects you if you get inside a metal body in a lightning storm. The partial shielding had no use, we'll find use for it here. So that's a little bit of a pre preview of where we're going. And um, let me see if in the next five minutes I can give you a little bit of a sense of what, what this device is so that we can set ourselves up for talking about uh, um, a good bit of the rest of this list on Thursday. So, I'm going to draw you the most classic capacitor, which is called a parallel plate capacitor. It's just two disconnected conducting plates. So, two uh, conducting plates. They're not touching each other. And they're both neutral to start with, so they don't have any charge at all. They're just equal collections of protons and electrons for both of them. But what we're going to do is we're going to connect it to a battery. The battery is what we're going to get the energy that gets put onto these things. So let me do that. So if they had no charge initially, no charge, and the voltage difference, of course, was zero. Okay, you, if you have two neutral different uh, neutral pieces of a thing, they're not going to have a voltage difference. But effectively what happens here is that these two conducting plates are like reservoirs and the battery is going to be the pump that pulls stuff off one and puts it on the other. So since we pretend that charges are positive charge carriers, <coughs> we pretend that positive charges get pulled off this plate and they get pumped onto this one. So it leaves this plate positive and this with a lack of negative force is uh, lack of positives becomes negatively charged. And again, if it bothers you, remember it's electrons really flowing the other way. So negatives are, uh, electrons are being pulled off the top plate and deposited on the bottom one. But we pretend that it's positive charged carriers that are mobile. The charges become equal and opposite. And the best justification for why I can give you for that is that this system overall is neutral. So you can't just suddenly have it. it has charge where it didn't have charge before. The battery just serves as a pump to take charge off one to the other. Now why does it do that? It of course is doing that because it's having this eventually has to join the equipotential of the higher voltage terminal. And this has to join the equipotential of the lower voltage terminal. Okay. So basically, 
It's taking these two neutral plates that get along perfectly fine, but it's asking them to join two different equipotentials. And that's not going to happen unless there's a movement of charge. So it has to build the positive plate to a higher voltage. It has to build the lower plate to a lower voltage so that the, it'll have some difference. Now, how, when does this process end? As you can probably guess, um, you charge the plates until their voltage difference, the voltage drop across the capacitor, becomes the same as the battery that charged it. Okay? So that's when the process is over. So when the battery has successfully made the voltage difference across the plates the same as it, its own voltage difference. Okay? So if we, for instance, had a 9 volt battery, this process would stop when the voltage difference between these two plates was 9 volts. Then basically each plate has joined the equipotential of the battery terminal it's connected to and the process is done. At this point, there is no difference between the plate, this plate and this terminal, so why would charges, any more charges flow? Why would, charges won't flow unless they have a reason to. And when this is not an energetically advantage anymore, right, when you have that this is exactly the same voltage as this, why would any charges flow anymore, okay? So basically we turned it from no voltage difference to the two plates have one as set by the battery. So, um, how much charge do you get on here? Well, the amount of charge that you can get on each plate, which is equal and opposite, is basically proportional, and I'm not going to justify this, but it's directly proportional to the voltage that you're charging it to. So, hopefully it's not shocking to hear that if I suddenly connect a capacitor to a 1,000 volt battery, that's going to put more charge on there than a 2 volt battery, right? Because you need a lot more charge on here to get it, the voltage difference to be that big. And I'm asking you to believe me that they are directly proportional, which is to say that if your charging battery is twice as much, you'll get twice as much charge, okay? So I'm asking you to believe me that these two things are directly proportional. If you put twice as big of a battery to charge it, you'll get twice as much charge on there before it's full, so to speak. And by full, I mean full for that battery. Okay? If, you, if you have one battery that can only put so much charge, and then you put a bigger battery, it'll put more charge. The proportionality constant is called the capacitance. So capacitance is the variable which we use to describe what is this relationship. So over here, when I say define capacitance, what I just have is like the equivalent of Ohm's law for a resistor. Q equals C times B. Okay? So you can see the laws are sort of similar. Here we have voltage drop, here we have voltage drop, here we have resistance, which is a property of the thing, here's capacitance, which we'll find is a property of the thing. The only difference, of course, is that here, this admits the flow indefinitely of charge, whereas here the charge accumulates. So one is I, one is Q. So they're very similar in that regard. Okay. Uh, let's knock off there for today, and we'll pick up some more stuff next time.